Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, Snape's Memories. I have never read the Harry Potter books. I don't plan to, but what I'm trying to say here is I did not see this twist coming. Very impactful because this wasn't just another sequel. There were multiple movies before this. There was already a lot of depth within Snape's character, but this just added a lot more. And of course, Alan Rickman delivered a very emotional and magnificent performance. I remember when he said the line always, everyone in the theater started clapping, which is one of the few times I've had an experience like that. I love the somber and melancholy feel that this scene kind of gives off. It is within Snape's character, so it really fits. I loved it that they showed old clips, so it helps the audience remember uh, everything that's happened up till this point. It makes the scene much more impactful. The music is really good too. It delivers that really sad feeling. Very heavy. Overall, a very memorable scene. Chicago, reach for the gun. I know everyone loves Cell Block Tango and I do as well, but the best sequence and song for me is Reach for the Gun. Now, there are two reasons why I have this song over Cell Block Tango. First reason being, this song is just a tiny bit catchier than Cell Block Tango. Again, a tiny bit, not by much. And the second reason being that there is a lot more hidden and subtle jokes in this sequence. For example, when a reporter asks Roxy how old she is, she nudges Billy Flynn so he doesn't answer the question. Another joke I really appreciate is when Billy Flynn is controlling the puppet, Mary Sunshine is doing her own dance routine, showing that she's really a puppet in disguise. You know, just stuff like that really adds a lot to this scene. It's also just a crazy good dance number and the choreography is brilliant. Besides the song though, the best part about this scene is the narrative behind it. One lawyer using the media as puppets is pretty fun to watch. Everyone except for Roxy in this movie just wants money. She wants to get famous, but everyone else just wants money. They don't give a shit about morals or the fame, they just want some cash. You can't help but to root for Billy Flynn, even though he's probably the biggest scumbag in the entire movie. But the reason why he's likable is because he's too charismatic and too intelligent to hate. Give me the fucking keys, you fucking cocksucker motherfucker! The usual suspects, line up. This scene isn't really clever. In fact, most of it was done by accident. One of the guys kept farting during filming and the director was so mad about wanting to restart, he just said, leave it in. And you know what? I'm glad he did. This is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. It's stupid and immature, but it's still hilarious. Fuck it, I gotta watch this scene a hundred times and still laugh. I mean, the fucking keys, you cocksucker, what the fuck? There's just something very comedic about a bunch of guys, grown men, not taking a situation seriously when they should, and they're being immature while doing it. That's all I really have to say. Hand me the keys, you fucking cocksucker. Barry Lyndon, The Duel. The events that lead up to this scene has a massive buildup. Due to the length of the movie, the audience has built a strong connection with Barry. In a sense, we see Barry as some sort of antagonist in this scene because for the majority of the movie, he's kind of a dickhead. Lord Bullingdon has every right to challenge Barry to a duel for everything he's done to him. So the audience is kind of rooting for Lord Bullingdon. But during this scene, we do not see Barry as some sort of aggressive, greedy man. We see someone who's more sympathetic and merciful. The most powerful scene in the entire movie is when Barry purposefully misfires in order for Lord Bullington to get his revenge. At the same time though, I don't think Barry wanted Lord Bullington to get his revenge and fire back because if he did, it would ruin his reputation. Someone is merciful and allows you to live, and you repay him by shooting them. And of course, Bullington gives in and shoots Barry. After that, it becomes a lose-lose situation. I'm sure most people in the audience were glad that that uh, Bullington got his revenge, but he didn't really gain anything in return. In fact, all he gained was a lot of debt. Revenge put him deeper in the rabbit hole. Some other aspects to enjoy about this film is, of course, the cinematography and the lighting. Barry Lyndon, the movie as a whole, is one of the most beautiful movies you'll ever see. Prince of Egypt, Burning Bush. I don't know if I said this before, but The Prince of Egypt is my favorite movie of all time. It's just a grand adventure with amazing animation and amazing soundtrack. Add complex characters and one pretty metal story, and you got a pretty damn good masterpiece. And yeah, while it's my favorite movie of all time, this isn't necessarily my favorite scene of all time, but it's still pretty damn good. The voice acting of God and Moses together, it just feels real, even though it's just an animated movie. The Prince of Egypt has a very unique art style to me. It's realistic and cartoonish at the same time, but it doesn't look weird or odd at any points for me. It just seems more adult. And the art style really shines here, especially with the white fire on the bush. But by far the best part of this scene is the soundtrack. The music is gorgeous, which makes sense because there's not one song in Prince of Egypt that's forgettable or bad. To me, every song in this film is magnificent. So I'm not surprised the burning bush theme is the best part of this scene. 
Deer Hunter, Russian Roulette. During the Call of Duty Black Ops campaign, you come across a scene that's very similar to the one in Deer Hunter, and that's how I came across this movie. I'm about 99% sure the Russian Roulette scene in Call of Duty Black Ops was inspired by the Russian Roulette scene in Deer Hunter, but I don't mind because the two scenes are both very intense and very well acted. There's a great combination of Christopher Walken's fear and Robert De Niro's wrath. I'm a huge Robert De Niro fan. I pretty much love every movie he's in. Okay, not every movie, but most. And to me, this is his most well-acted scene. Acting aside, though, what really sells this scene is the build-up. De Niro's character knows that when adding more bullets, the likelihood of him killing himself is a lot higher, but also increases the chances of shooting the Viet Cong around him. And Walken's character is too afraid to catch on, and that's why he takes longer to shoot himself in the head. I feel like the Russian roulette scene adds a lot of characterization based off the actions alone. We see that De Niro's character is a little more cunning than Walken's character, and he's able to adapt better, which I see as a little bit of foreshadowing for De Niro and Walken's character at the end of the movie. This is by far one of the most intense scenes I've ever seen in any film. Inglorious Bastards, The Jew Hunter. This opening scene alone made Hans one of my favorite cinematic characters. He's a lot like Littlefinger in a way. He controls every situation he's in, but when it becomes too cocky, it leads to his own downfall. Starting off this scene, Hans comes across as a very polite gentleman, but the French dairy farmer sees through his disguise and knows Hans' true intentions right away. When Hans starts to question the dairy farmer about the missing Jewish families, the dairy farmer starts to become a little uneasy. He begins to smoke and stumble between speaking French and English. After Hans is given the names of the members of the one Jewish family, much like Littlefinger, he starts to brag about his own nickname because he relishes in what he does. Based off the presence of Hans' confidence, it becomes quite apparent that the French dairy farmer is harboring a Jewish family in his home. When Hans reveals what he knows, the audience then understands why he wanted the dairy farmer to speak English with him, so the Jewish family doesn't understand their conversation. And when the dairy farmer reveals the location of the family, they're killed except for Shoshana, who escapes. Within a scene, there's typically a little story inside, and this opening segment has the best setup of any other scene on this list. Not only that, but the acting is goddamn incredible. Of course, Christopher Waltz did an amazing job, but the dairy farmer also nailed his role. There is no music being played until the beginning of the massacre of the family, and the silence just builds up the suspense more and more. Even the cinematography is perfect. Everything about this scene is 100% perfect. Hunchback of Notre Dame, Hellfire. I still cannot fathom why this movie is rated G. You have corruption in the church, people almost being burned to death, genocide, and of course an old man who's lustful for a young woman. I believe Hunchback is a very dark but also a very awesome movie. It's probably my favorite animated Disney movie. To me, they took a lot of risks, but I think it worked out. Now, it was kind of hard to choose between Hellfire and the Bells of Notre Dame because both are amazing scenes. But Hellfire has a slight edge only because it has Tony J singing. We get a little bit of that in the Bells of Notre Dame sequence, but here it's just all him. And Tony J had the coolest fucking voice ever. And with a combination of his voice, the music, and the visuals, you get a pretty cool fucking scene. The meaning behind the scene, though, is also very good and dark, which is perfect for the movie. And Judge Claude Frollo is battling his own lust over a young gypsy woman and saying she's corrupting his soul and all this stuff. And when I first saw this, like, four years ago, I was pretty shocked about how adult this was. Like, this is pretty dark for kids, and that's why that fucking G rating pisses me off. I don't understand it. But anyways, this is a very dark scene, but also very beautiful. Star Wars Binary Sunset. Funny thing about the Binary Sunset scene, it's incredibly short and pointless, but that doesn't necessarily make it unnecessary. Now, we already know that George Lucas kind of sucks at making dialogue, especially in the prequels, but when he has a scene where characters aren't talking at all, it hits hard. For example, Revenge of the Sith had a lot of terrible dialogue, but that one scene where Padme and Anakin are just looking at Coruscant, it's beautiful. Not just because dialogue isn't present, but also because of the music of John Williams. And his music shines the most in the binary sunset scene. From a technical standpoint, there isn't much happening. Luke is simply just looking at two suns. But because of the scenery, the setting, the acting, and of course the music, a lot of emotion is just bursting out of the scene. And I think this is really where Luke becomes a very likable character. We just met him him, but just through this scene alone, we can really identify with him. About wanting more and unleashing your full potential. Very impactful scene and gives me goosebumps every time. Old Boy, Corridor Fight. If you haven't seen the film Old Boy yet, I strongly urge you to watch it right now. It is one of the best films I have ever seen. I would even go as far as to call it a perfect movie. It's that good. 
This fight scene is also the best movie fight scene I've ever seen. It's not super acrobatic, uh, it's not flashy, it's not super big, and that's why I like it. I do like those type of fights, but this one is more closed in and realistic, which aren't in many movies anymore. No CGI, it's all practical. Now, there was a, a 2013 remake of this film, and it sucks. Like, really sucks. It's so fucking bad. Unless you, uh, have a hard-on for Scarlet Witch and Thanos being together, then I strongly recommend you don't watch the movie. Now, the reason why this fight works and the one in the remake doesn't is because it's all closed in and it's all realistic. The remake focuses on making Josh Brolin this, like, super badass guy who can take on 50 men, uh, in this big area, but the reason why the main character in Old Boy, Odesu, was able to fight all these goons is because they were in a closed-in hallway space. So they all couldn't attack him at once, Maybe a couple guys at the same time, but not all of them. Another nice detail about the uh, thugs is that they're falling over on each other, they're missing their swings at Ode Su, and, you know, it, it just adds a little bit more realism to it. You know, they're not super accurate, they're not these uh, highly skilled goons. And you don't have this uh, shitty rock music in the background while badass Josh Brolin beats up all 50 men at the same time. Blah, blah, blah. And yeah, Ode Su walks away from this fight with a goddamn knife in his back, but he's at the point where he has to be hospitalized. So he's not like this uh, invincible superhuman like Josh Brolin's character. We see him struggle throughout the fight too. He gets pinned down a couple of times. While Josh Brolin's character basically goes through 50 men no problem. And it's only at the end where he gets stabbed in the back by a knife, and that doesn't really do anything to him, so... Didn't matter. Like, literally, it's just a reference from the first movie. It's basically saying, oh, remember when Ode Su got stabbed in the back? Oh, well, so did Josh Brolin's character. It's not a subtle or clever reference, it's just stupid. Why was this scene remade? Why did Spike Lee even remake this movie? It was already perfect to begin with. They take away the good music, they take away the good action, they take away the acting, and just give us this watered-down schluck. Oh, and by the way, the soundtrack in the 2003 Old Boy is amazing, especially in this scene. 